welcome to the Transition Dialogue podcasts. My name is Alicia Pacevic. I'm an expert in education at the Center for Citizenship Education in Poland. And uh, this is part of a project that we have started uh, some time ago with the participation of uh, countries from the uh, Eastern and Central Europe that have uh, gone through transition from communism to, well, yes, we don't know exactly how to call the period we are in. Some countries say transition has ended in the 90s, it began in 1989 in Poland, but then went through the whole uh, Eastern and Central Europe. And uh, some people say it has ended in the 90s or in the moment when some of our countries entered the European Union. But there are others who are saying that we are still in transition. And uh, it's very interesting and insightful to look into the period that we are going through. This is a very unique experience, the generational experience of not only one generation, the one that has brought um, the transition into life, but also all the um, generations that came later and are living the consequences of the, the tran political, social, economic transformation. This is the sort of a dream come true, not only from the political perspective of the uh, fall of communism, but also a sort of a dream come true for a historian, for a social psychologist, for a sociologist, this big wave of changes that happened uh, here is really something completely unique and not so easy to uh, understand. Some people call it a self-limiting revolution. Others say it was just, you know, one of the many social changes that uh, the humanity went through. Whatever the perspective you take, it's incredible to look into how in our countries, in different countries, in Poland, Lithuania, Germany, Bulgaria, Russia, Ukraine, how it was done and what are the big differences between our different ways of transition, but also what are the similarities, the general patterns that we can observe. But the goal of the um, Transition Dialogue Project is not really to find the historical truth about transition. It's more about teaching transition and talking on transition, how the knowledge and perceptions of transition are formed and how they are then uh, spread and what is the relation, for example, between public discourse on uh, what has happened in our countries and uh, how it's then taught in the schools. So why are we doing this? We are doing this to really become more aware of uh, how transition is, is and can be uh, taught and can be debated in the schools and in informal settings in our countries while using the incredible opportunity to have a sort of a cross-border angles. That's why we are inviting you to a series of podcasts, Transition Dialogues, uh, in which we will dialogue about uh, three important topics. Now we are inviting you to listen to the podcast Teaching Transition in Post-Communist Countries. I have invited to the podcast Vedrana Pribisevic from Croatia, and she is also taking part in the work of uh, 
um, the project, the work that has begun with the mapping of national curricula and national recommendations on how to teach a transition. And she has a lot to say about it. Uh, before we start, I would like also to tell you that uh, Vedrana is uh, teaching economics at Zagreb School of Economic and Management, a top business school in Croatia. Uh, but she's also a media commentator, appears very uh, frequently on different media and uh, is very provocative commentator of uh, public life in this country. So I hope that during our meeting, during our uh, recording, we will also have some interesting um, topics to, to argue about or to agree. <laughs> the first thing that we wanted to, to talk about, and this is my question to you, Vedrana, is it really necessary to teach transition? I mean, do students, do teachers, do our nations need education on transition? Well, Alicia, to be quite frank with you, I think uh, children in high school especially need to know about transition to understand the current state of the world around. Uh, they need to understand that whatever they see around them, uh, the uh, yeah, corruption, uh, the, you know, uh, people emigrating from Croatia since Croatia entered the EU in 2013, that all of this was due to a particularly poorly done transition process and that the transition process in Croatia is not yet finished. So it is of paramount importance, I would say, for children, for students to study this, um, but uh, do so objectively. Because they will ask themselves questions, um, you know, um, is capitalism, you know, the, the, is this capitalism, right? Is this what I see around me capitalism? Is this, is it, uh, is it normal that children of, uh, you know, um, and the children of very affluent, um, you know, tycoons uh, kill people in the street with their cars and get away with it? Is, you know, is, is this how... Uh, the world is supposed to look like? And of course, the question is no. And for them to understand what went wrong, they have to, uh, they have to learn something about transition. Yes, yes. And this is a very similar situation in Poland. And um, this, what you are saying, is also um, even aggravated by the fact that, for example, in Poland, a narrative on transition is a subject of political... Um, propaganda. Very often uh, you can see that the consequent governments and political parties and media are very much biased in their narrative about the transition. The main heroes change, the main causes um, are defined in a different way, and of course the outcomes, which is uh, also very important. There are different people are blamed for the things that didn't go well, as you as you said before, um, in Croatia. That's in your opinion, tra transition was not done uh, properly, and uh, this is uh, how uh, it ends now. That many people, as I know, many young people are leaving Croatia um to the european union and to just look for a better life so my second question is is it easy to teach a transition or is it difficult and if so what what are the circumstances that you are teaching in well that's a, a fantastic question because the project itself um entailed um, uh, was scrutinizing very deeply the learning materials that the students and the teachers have at their disposal uh, for the study of transition. And we have deeply delved into these materials and, and the transition is taught in like maybe two or three subjects, so like geography and history, 
And um, yeah, there is economy and politics is a subject they have in the third grade of, of the gymnasium where they learn something about transition. Each and every textbook is extremely, and I really mean extremely biased in the sense that information inside is factually incorrect. So the, I, I cannot, it's, you know, fake news. This did not happen. This, and the narrative, how, um, how the, uh, the, the book is laid out and how uh, um, events uh, such as a rise in, let's say, or an increase in, um, uh, let's say, uh, public debt, or um, as Croatia became more open, uh, all of this is portrayed in a narrative, us vs them. So the, I would say that the curriculum is being used for nationalistic purposes, in this case, for nation building, because Poland has had the opportunity to be a uh, to, to to achieve statehood um, in in some sense far before Croatia, but Croatia still uh, has this need uh, to use the curriculum, you know, to kind of portray these mythologies. I call them mythologies because um, there's this, you know, every nation has some sort of myth and these, right, would you agree with me that these myths are quite strong, yeah? And here, uh, and here, uh, you know, uh, the, the transition, especially the transition, um, the transition um, uh, um, teaching, um, uh, teaching curriculum is uh, used for these purposes together with, of course, the homeland war, because the two, Two things intervene, intertwine, right? They, you know, uh, the the homeland war and then the transition, and then you know, transition is sort of kind of pushed aside, but it really no textbook really explains what happened. You know, no no textbook really explains how did we, how did these factories end up in the hands of the people they ended up in. This is not explained anywhere. The only thing that's explained is the homeland war, which is of course an important topic. Uh, and then, then there is, you know, the us and them rhetoric that 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 follows, right? So this is okay. Mm -hmm. Us and them. This is yeah. This is uh, very common in teaching history, and I like very much um, a comment by um, one of the um, leading ex uh, experts in history teaching in um, Europe that has written um, a sort of a. Um, guidebook for teaching 20th century European history published by a Council of Europe and he uh, says a problem arises when we move from national history to nationalistic history as it very often happens history is then used for propaganda and indoctrination purposes it emphasizes differences in relation to neighboring countries exalts uniformities conceals the history of re regions and minorities and always defines itself in relation to external enemies what kind what enemies do you define transition history and uh, this whole contemporary history uh, in croatia textbooks well the his you know in the history textbooks the enemy uh, is usually them and them by this them is meant everybody who's not a Croatian, of course. And, uh, you know, I can't stop, you know, thinking about um, uh, a few sentences that I've read the, in the textbooks themselves that kind of portray the entire, the, the late period of the transition at the beginning um, of, um, of the 21st century as a time where uh, foreign powers have somehow gained footing in Croatia and we're draining Croatia of resources. So sort of this new colonial narrative that, you know, and that us, uh, uh, you know, uh, entering the EU is only to, going to make this worse. And mind you, this is in a, you know, this is in a high school textbook. This, this this propaganda okay. that's clearly anti-European, uh, anti, you know, uh, unitaristic. It's um, it's I I, can, I I don't know how this ended up there. And the real question is, how did the ministry ever allow for such a textbook? 
because you know this is how you you know this is how fascism comes to power you know you start uh, portraying everybody who's not of your nation as an enemy and the textbook does exactly this right okay so I think this is uh, a trend which uh, one can also notice in other countries um, uh, judging by the mapping of national curricula and textbooks that we have done in Transition Dialogue Project uh, in almost every country, in Lithuania, in Poland, in Ukraine, in Bulgaria, even in Russia, you have those external enemies or the internal enemies, but uh, those enemies at the end, even if they are internal, they are portrayed as see and seen as uh, secret agents of the um, uh, external enemies. So for example, in Poland, of course, the main uh, um, external um, enemy was uh, Russia. And if you talk about transition, it's always Russia uh, that, that, um, that is portrayed as a power to, to be um fought with but also uh, there is another kind of enemies and these are internal enemies of the new uh, order the proponents and defendants of the old system and it very often turns out that it's because of their conspiracies and the yes conspiracies that uh, the transition didn't go as well as it could do so we don't look at the economic troubles or the struggles between various political factions. We look for someone who is to be blamed and it is them either in the country or directly linked to the external enemies. This is a sort of also mythical power of the external enemy and unfortunately in teaching transition it's always it's often used in in different uh, countries participating in the project so um and do you think that teachers like to teach about transition is it easy for them oh i i think it's absolutely terrible the materials that they're they're given they're i'm not even sure that they know how to teach it and i've spoken to a few teachers and you know sometimes they don't know you know, they're kind of ashamed what's in the textbook because a good deal of them were actually good students, right? And then you, if you were a good student, you just can't say lies. And, you know, teachers do have morals. So they sometimes outright skip it, okay? So to provide, if we could provide the teachers with the resources that are uh, objective, uh, that are truthful, and that they're very instructive and insightful, uh, I think they would greatly benefit from this. Because right now, a lot of the teachers are in, you know, saying that they don't teach transition because it is so controversial. And what they have as teaching materials it's not even clear to them what they need to do with the with the students, right? So okay. this is this is this is a huge a huge issue. Yeah, we have in in Poland. I don't know how it's in Croatia, but in Poland we have a, an additional um, problem that transition is always taught at the end of the school year. So it's usually you know end of May or uh, June where when people are really not so much focused uh, on learning but rather you know getting uh, are tired and they they just want to go on vacation and this is very difficult to to change because this is a chronological course which is also one of the problems of teaching history that probably should be solved at one point and uh, when i was interviewing students and teachers uh, on how the they transition is taught, um, students were saying, oh, I haven't been taught at all. There were some anecdotes. There was a short chapter in the textbook. And then, because I, I was very interested, I had to study by myself. It's not uh, as it should be. So there is this, um, on the side of young people, at least 
uh, in Poland, but I think it's uh, more universal, this need for understanding what has happened and what, uh, why are we still seeing the consequences of this transition which was done, which has its flaws. It was a big emancipatory process, but also in every country there were some things which were missed or, or uh, haven't been done um, in a proper way. So I think that if we um, really have the good materials and the, uh, the message from the um, authorities that it's important to teach transition, that this is one of the priorities, uh, it can be done in a much better way. For example, if you ask Polish students what were the most important moments in Polish history, they would, most of them would say, Second World War and the fall of communism. So this is something they really and this is, and and Second World War was a you know dramatic um, event and the fall of communism. Most of them uh, see as uh, something very positive. So they want to understand why it hasn't gone as well as everyone had hoped for. There is a big potential in teaching transition, especially because, as you are saying, it's a work in progress. Also in Poland, maybe in you know in historical terms, the transition was, one could say it has ended when we entered the European Union. But on a larger, uh, in a larger image, we are still somehow in transformation, in transition. So it's really, it would be great also to see the differences and similarities between transition, let's say in Poland, Croatia, Bulgaria, Ukraine, Germany, or Russia. So this is, there is a big chunk of a very valuable material, including eyewitnesses who, still, who are still alive, a lot of good educational material to be profited from. And this is so difficult to, uh, to somehow get to it and to use it at school. Uh, and I have, so I have one question because uh, as uh, in Poland, probably also in Croatia, there are many teachers who are still trying to do uh, some you know, good things with it even with the lack of unbiased textbooks and other difficulties, what, what good examples or what bad examples do you have in, in your mind? <laughs> Um, well, uh, there are definitely teachers, some that I worked with uh, in the transition dialogue, uh, uh, like my colleague uh, Vedran Ristic, uh, who teaches in Osijek, which is the uh, uh, most eastern part, uh, in the most eastern part of Croatia, and it's actually quite a poorer part of Croatia, and uh, unfortunately poor uh, in Croatia uh, correlates with more nationalistic and what he does and and we've also incorporated this into the the lesson the lesson plans we've made is for instance eyewitness history because uh, some of these people especially the grandmothers and the grandfathers of the of the students are still alive and uh, you can um, have them uh, have students conduct conduct interviews with them right and to ask them okay so you know very structured interview can you remember how it was uh, you know where did you work how did you work how much you were paid can you remember the inflation can you remember what happened uh, you know, uh, how did the privatization go? Uh, you know, what can you recall from that time? And I think this is a powerful tool and it should be used because the students get to ask someone they know and uh, you can give, give them uh, structured questionnaires that are aimed at inquiry. So that's a nice way of, of, of teaching transition. Another nice way that we've also incorporated into our lesson plan is to take, uh, let's say, tourism as a, um, you know, a, a, a leisurely activity everybody enjoys, both in socialism and in capitalism, and then just illustrate how tourism has changed. 
right? And, um, and you can find uh, a lot of uh, old ads in, uh, in the archives, right? So you find old ads for, let's say, a summer vacation, um, and then you compare, and you compare what you see today, and you compare what you had back then, because in, in, in Croatia, we had a different type of socialism. This was worker self-management, so it was different than Poland and most definitely very different than Russia. But we had workers who, who had resorts on, um, on the coast, right? So uh, the workers uh, and the company uh, uh, would um, um, build the resort uh, on the coast and this is where the workers would go for a vacation. And you think that's a great idea, uh, but some, you know, some grandmothers and grandfathers did not like this because, you know, if you want to go for a vacation, you don't necessarily want to go with your coworkers. You want to go with your, you know, your family and, you know, you want to get away from the office and not you know bring your office with you so i think that you know using these instruments and using something that clearly has not changed in the last you know 50 60 years people's desire to travel people's desire to go to the seaside because this almost you know uh, like uh, religion here in croatia and uh, i think that the poles are also uh, uh, particularly fond of it uh, since uh, a lot of poles come to croatia to go to the seaside right this is something an activity that you can use to illustrate differences with what was back in socialism, how transition worked out, uh, you know, what happened to the state-owned hotels, uh, what happened to the small, uh, small uh, rentiers who rent out their small apartments, uh, why don't we have large um, hotel chains, uh, you know, what, what went wrong, okay? So this was, uh, this was also a nice way of how, um, uh, how you can make transition very relatable to students, right? Because all of them, after all, go for a vacation with their family at some point in their lives. Yeah, and it's very re relatable to me. I have been uh, three times to Croatia, <laughs> Korčula Island. I think it's one of, it's a paradise. It's a paradise. It was in the uh, late uh, 90s. So it was, you know, at the heart of <laughs> transition almost. And um, I remember this, these um, difficulties that, you know, no, it was really difficult to find out who was uh, ruling, who was in power of a, of a place that uh, to be rented. So there were still some um, uh, nationalized places, and, and, but the private small motels and apartments, this was the real the real um, thing and uh, I'm, I'm wondering why are you um, worried that big hotel chains are not functioning in Croatia it's good I think yeah well it is good but on one one hand you know what's because hotels in generate employment right and, uh, you know, having just an apartment that you rent out over the summer is not very good for accumulation of human capital, because then you think, should I go to college? And we are, you know, college doesn't, or uh, uh, university education doesn't sound so great if you can make uh, enough money just by, you know, renting out an apartment for two months, right? Yeah. This is, you know, there's definitely a crowding out effect that exists. And now we can see it in the data. Right, you can even see that uh, fewer people, especially on the coast, go on to university after finishing a secondary education because of this. Uh, but you know, having ho having hotels, you know, and having uh, uh, also small small um, uh, small apartment renters, you know, both should exist. But the problem is that in Croatia, eighty percent of all uh, all uh, you know accommodation is those tiny renters so you know that has its own problems it has problems with the infrastructure you know uh, it has problems with tax evasion so there are a number of of, um, of bad sides to this but bottom line is you know uh, the reason why we have that is this unbalanced structure is due to transition to transition not occurring as it should right 
Wonderful, wonderful. I would be very curious to get um, some more details, uh, but uh, I, I'm afraid we don't have time now. But one thing that I'd like to uh, advertise is the lesson plan on uh, tourism uh, during transition, before, during and after transition in Croatia that has been prepared by, by the teachers cooperating with you. And I hope it will be available for, for all of us, because I think that this sort of analysis could be very similar in, in different countries um, uh, of the project. And this is a very concrete example, a very good concrete example on um, how to make transition uh, relatable. In, the, in our case, we have, uh, we have a more, let's say, uh, sophisticated um, topic, which is self-government how it was um, introduced in Poland and uh, to what extent it was successful. But we are also trying to make it not only, I mean, the lesson plan is not only about the legal structure and the structure of power on the, in the local government, but also uh, how it influences the everyday life of uh, us all as citizens of those communes, of those small places which are really close to the um, people and are uh, the this is the the branch of power which is um, has the highest uh, esteem and highest ranking in Poland not the central government not the parliament not anyone else it's the local governments with all you know difficulties that they are going through they are still the most trusted part of the public uh, authority in Poland. And this is something which was brought um, by transition because before we, the power uh, was completely centralized and there were some fictional uh, councils in the towns, but it didn't really work. And um, I think that uh, um, also uh, we could see some very good examples in Polish schools of the um, let's say working with controversies, taking out a, a topic, taking out a problem that uh, doesn't have one answer, that can be judged from, you know, different points of view. So, for example, um, the, the, the problem of the workers of the national owned uh, farms, because it was privatized, it was, it's now, uh, you know, all in private hands. Maybe there is, uh, there are a few national farms which uh, the Poland was co Poland was covered with them, uh, totally before um, before the fall of communism. But uh, and you know, from the economic point of view, I would say um, it's good. But if you look at those at the um, lives of the people who have lost the place of work and uh, they were left with uh, nothing because they didn't own the the apartments that they were living in they they are allowed to stay there and most of them still live in those houses but no one really takes care of those um, buildings and the people were left without anything and um, so this is i think such you know um, focusing on or zooming in on specific problems that were brought uh, by uh, transition, I think this is also making the thing more re uh, relatable, but also more uh, true. Okay, last question, my last questions. If you were now to teach about uh, transition um, in the, um, let's say, high school, what would be one thing which you wouldn't miss? that you would really want to include in your teaching? Well, definitely the one thing that I would uh, not like to miss is privatization. This is something, it's a controversial topic uh, because uh, in Croatia, as you might know, transition uh, uh, privatization was criminal in the sense that um, a lot of the companies that were privatized quickly went bankrupt. So we have an entire uh, uh, elite that emerged um, with um, you know, uh, entire companies in hand 
uh, and they just then uh, you know stopped production and uh, gave everybody uh, unfortunately gave everybody you know uh, fired everyone and then just sold companies assets um, so this is one one uh, aspect of transition I would most focus on because it's not talked about, um, I think, um, and the, the students will, under, will, will would understand the world around them much, much better if they understood when, what, what went wrong in the privatization, right? So, and how, how did we do it? There are other more successful, uh, more successful um, attempts and uh, uh, at, at privatization, such as in Czech Republic, uh, which was done through vouchers and a number of other uh, countries that the privatization went way better than in Croatia. But here, unfortunately, we had a war and uh, having a war, you know, you, the greatest thieves <laughs> emerge in war. And I think for the students to understand who is who in Croatia today, I think we need to teach them about privatization. Wonderful. And I would love to have such a lesson plan also and such sort of education in Poland because it also um, I mean, I don't know to what extent the privatization was criminal, but there were many bad things that happened and it would be very uh, interesting to really delve into it. And uh, from my point of view, what's also very important in, in um, our case, it would be what has happened to the um, actors, uh, not only the main heroes of transition, but to the big groups that have um, really made uh, the dream of uh, fall of communism come true. I'm thinking about the workers, all the poor people who are also supporting it. Solidarity in the 8081 had 10 million members. This was, I think, the biggest uh, trade union uh, of uh, this kind of resistance. And it has happened in within three months or four months. So it was and the how uh, the social process and the political processes after 1989, how they have led to this big polarization uh, that we have now and to those two counter narratives on transition that uh, we are experiencing in Poland. One saying that it was, you know, a miracle only and uh, all positive and uh, the other saying that it was complete disaster and that it was done in a wrong way. And that's why we are now suffering uh, so much because there were so many people who did it uh, wrong or who are stealing or who were not really taken, I mean, they were not punished for what they were doing before the fall of communism. So also this topic of, you know, crime and punishment of communists and to what extent is it still really, are they still in power and what should be done with them? And here I think it's a very good um, area for comparison because in every country, uh, this um, thinking about the, you know, uh, justice, <laughs> transitional justice was uh, different. And I hope that we will be able to present some very good ideas for teaching on how transitional justice uh, could work and why it hasn't worked well in many, um, in many countries, um, including Poland. If I may add something shortly, I mean, yeah. a lot of people were on board for transition because they expected for everyone to benefit from it, right? Yeah. So this was this was this was uh, you know the, the in Croatia on the, uh, when when we gained independence, I think the referendum was like ninety something eight percent that we should leave Yugoslavia and uh, abandon uh, you know our form of communism altogether, um, and this was you know uh, almost a unanimous vote on this. And a lot of people expected that everything, all the wrongs of socialism would be undone in transition and everything would be fine. Unfortunately, this has not occurred. 
transition has created losers and it has created winners. And these are quite might be very surprising to to you know to to some people, right? They're not sometimes, especially in Croatia, not sometimes always apparent. Like the losers are apparent, but the winners are hmm, not as apparent. And yeah. I think that this, yeah, this question of justice. Uh, transitional justice is definitely something that ne wor is worth investigating. Thank you. Thank you very much, Vedrana, for your insight and for your comments. And I'm very happy that we are together trying to find a better way for teaching transition in our countries and in all post-communist countries. This podcast was part of a Transition Dialogue project. Transition Dialogue, dealing with change in democratic ways. The project is financed by the Federal Agency for Civic Education as uh, implemented by a consortium of partners, um, including Sofia Platform from Bulgaria, Stiftung Wissen am Werk and Institute of Social Sciences, Ivo Pilar from Croatia, Open Lithuania Foundation from Lithuania, Center for Citizenship Education from Poland, a Congress of Cultural Activists from Ukraine, and the Museum of the Victims of uh, Totalitarianism from Perm, Russia. Our common work is coordinated by deutsch russischer Austausch from Berlin.